You are looking live at Detroit, Michigan, where Kamala Harris and her newly minted running mate, Tim Walls, are set to speak later this hour as they continue their sprint through the swing states. We will bring you those remarks as they happen. Earlier today, Harris and Walls started their battleground blitz in Wisconsin. In this campaign, I'll tell you, I will proudly put my record against his any day of the week. Hot on their trail, Republican vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance, who earlier today tried to make a little bit of a scene with Vice President Harris's entourage. I just, I just wanted to check out my future plane, but I also wanted to go say hello to the vice president. It's 90 days till Election Day. Both vice presidential candidates are set, and we are here to break down the latest in the wildest, wooliest general election in a generation. The Hill on News Nation starts now. Good evening. I am Chris Steyerwald filling in for our friend Blake Berman. It's a day one for the Harris Walls ticket as the vice president and her new running mate, the governor of Minnesota. They just made the short trip from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, to Detroit, Michigan, and we will hear from them soon. But a slew of new polls show the presidential race is neck and neck, as you can see here in the Decision Desk HQ polling average. Quite a change from three weeks ago. Just look at how polls have tightened in these six swing states since President Biden dropped out of the race. While former President Donald Trump is still ahead in four, Harris is gaining and for now has the momentum. And the Harris campaign reports that in the 24 hours after announcing Walls, the campaign raised $36 million. That's on top of a $200 million fundraising bonanza since she moved to the top of the ticket. We are not going back. We sure are, but it's even more than that. This is a campaign about where we're going, and that's a future where everyone matters and everyone's included. But after three weeks back on their heels, Republicans are coming out swinging against Walls, trying to define the little-known Midwestern governor as, quote, dangerously liberal. And they are zeroing in on his record, hitting him for progressive stances on abortion and transgender issues, as well as going from an NRA A-rated member of Congress to a governor who favored expanded background checks for gun purchases. He also passed the largest budget in Minnesota history just last year and established paid medical and family leave, major infrastructure spending, free college tuition for low-income students, legal recreational pot, the list goes on. After weeks of taking a beating in the press, opponent J.D. Vance is hoping to make Walls the weird one now, honing in on the attention for the new Democratic ticket as Harris and Walls crisscross the country and Vance going after Walz's military service. When Tim Waltz was asked by his country to go to Iraq, you know what he did? He dropped out of the army and allowed his unit to go without him, a fact that he's been criticized for aggressively by a lot of the people that he served with. Whoa, Nelly. The Harris campaign pushing back, touting Walz's work for veterans in Congress following his service in the National Guard, and quote, Governor Walls would never insult or undermine any American service to this country. In fact, he thanks Senator Vance for putting his life on the line for our country. It's the American way. Joining us now is Massachusetts Demo Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton. Congressman, thank you for making time for us. Uh, Good to see you. You, you served with distinction in Iraq as a Marine. Senator Vance uh, was also there as a combat correspondent for the Marine Public Affairs section. Is Governor Walls's record fair game for these kinds of attacks? Well, I don't think it should be. Uh, he served the country honorably for over 20 years. In fact, when he reached the 20 year mark, when most in the military get out, because that's the retirement age, that's when you're eligible for retirement, he actually reenlisted uh, after 9-11. His decision to get out uh, before his unit deployed to Iraq was made before uh, he knew that the unit was going. So this is really just run of the mill. And the fact that Trump and Vance are attacking his service is really more symptomatic of the fact that Trump and Vance, especially Trump, just likes to attack veterans. I mean, we've heard some of the horrible things that Trump has said about veterans being losers or suckers, disparaging those who lost their lives, attacking Senator McCain for being captured as a POW in Vietnam. This is really just par for the course with the Trump Vance team to attack Americans who put their lives on the line for our country. OK, Trump and Republicans are painting walls and the ticket is too progressive. Here's what the former president said this morning on Fox News. 
He's probably more so than Bernie Sanders. She is more so than Bernie Sanders. There's never been a ticket like this. This is a ticket that would want this country go, to go communist immediately, if not sooner. Uh, we want no security. Mm -hmm. We want no anything. Uh, <laughs> after a shaky start, Republicans <laughs> seem to have settled on a message that has worked many times in the past against your party. Uh, I'm sure you have been called a Massachusetts liberal in your, okay. in your life. <laughs> Uh, Walls is a hero to progressives, but does he move the ticket too far to the left? I mean, you, you were laughing at this. I was laughing. I served with uh, for years uh, with Walls in, in the House of Representatives, and he was widely known on both sides of the aisle for being extremely moderate, a sort of extreme moderate, someone who held one of the most conservative Democratic districts, uh, a district that actually has been Republican most of the time, but he was able to win it in multiple tough elections by being someone who's consistently worked across the aisle, who's been willing to buck the Democratic Party uh, in terms of his moderation. And the fact of the matter is they're just zeroing in on a, on a couple of key issues where he was able to do things that were good for Minnesotans. I mean, he voted for the Affordable Care Act, which got more of his constituents health care. I think the constituents that he represents who were able to get health care when they didn't have it before are probably proud of Representative Walls at the time uh, for making those votes. OK, another line of attack from Republicans has been that Democrats are too tolerant of anti-Semitism. And at, at the very least, there have been some mixed signals on that. Missouri Democratic Congresswoman Cori Bush was defeated in her primary Tuesday, and she had certainly made some incendiary remarks about Israel. But on the other hand, not just Republicans, but some Democrats believe that part of the reason Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro was not chosen for the VP slot uh, was because he is a proudly observant Jew, and that might rankle some members of your party. I, is that is that fair? Does uh, some segment of your party have an anti-Semitism problem? I mean, R Republicans are really grabbing at straws here. Uh, now, I certainly don't agree with people like Cori Bush and, and, and her stance uh, towards Israel. Uh, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of Israel and its right to defend itself, uh, especially in the wake of these horrific uh, terrorist attacks on October 7th. Uh, but I mean, this is just excuse me. Where is Tim Walls on this? I mean, where where on earth have, has anyone ever said that he has an anti-Semitic bone in his body? Uh, I think it's just a spurious line of attack. I mean, it's, it's almost like they're just giving up on attacking walls um, because he's so bulletproof. And now they're just trying to level some generic attack at the, at the party. It's not going to stick. It's, it's silly. And it's uh, a symptom of the fact that I think the Trump advance campaign right now is really kind of flailing, trying to figure out uh, how to respond uh, to this dramatic shift from the Democrats. Is it a good thing that Cori Bush lost her primary? Well, look, it's up to the voters of the district, you know, and they made a choice. That's the beauty of democracy. I won a very contentious primary defeating an 18 year incumbent when I came to Congress. And there were some people in Congress who some incumbents who were friends with the uh, with the, the guy that I beat who were upset at me. But you know what? The majority of them said, hey, your voters chose you. That's the way democracy works. And that's ultimately the choice that we should support. OK, if you were from Newburyport, you would know him already. But if you don't, there he is in a very lovely kitchen with a very nice fern. Congressman Seth Moulton, we thank you very much for your time. Thank Joining you. us you. today, you know her because you like her. It's Linda Tran. She's a former senior advisor to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. John McCormick, he's my friend. He's my colleague. He's a senior editor at The Dispatch. T.W. Arigiri? Am I going to say it right? Arigi. Arigi. Yeah, okay. I appreciate the effort. I wanted to put a little, I wanted to put a little something extra on it. Arigi. Uh, Arigi, yes. Okay. Former communications aide to Senator Lindsey Graham and Mike Pompeo. Hey, what about that? Okay. And Jay Manch, Julia Manchester, national political reporter for The Hill. Wow. What a panel. What good news. Uh, okay. Cori Bush may not have lost, or may have lost, but she is not going quietly, vowing to go after the pro-Israel lobby group, APAC. She's the second squad member to lose a primary this year. That as much as I love my job, but all they did was radicalize me, and so now they need to be afraid. APAC, I'm coming to tear your kingdom down. Sweet, fancy Moses. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> I, uh, Julia, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to start with you. Um, on, on this question about how Israel divides Democrats, um, and we just heard Seth Moulton take 
I, what I would say, sort of the maximalist position that right. we hear on Israel among Democrats, staunch, right to defend mm-hmm. itself, da 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 da. And then you have the maximalist position in the other direction of Cory Bush coming to tear him down. What what's going on? Well, look, this is the past week. Whether it's been the debate over Josh Shapiro and his stance on Israel, Cory Bush, uh, this shows that this divide in the Democratic Party is continuing really to rattle, um, and it's not going away. It's it's continuing to rattle the party with Josh Shapiro in particular, though. You know, I was talking to progressives all last weekend, asking them about this, and they say, look, it's not necessarily his stance on Israel, it's his response to the protests. The protests. But that being said, why was this, there this campaign calling him Genocide Josh, but not, you know, Genocide Tim or what, whatever? His stance on Israel is nearly identical to the other uh, prospective uh, Veep Stakes contenders um, who were Veep Stakes contenders. So it, it, it's a question, and it, it isn't going away. As we see the situation in the Middle East continue to get apparently more dire, it's something that Democrats are going to have to deal with. John, did you know that I interviewed Tim Walls one time? I did not know that. Well, why don't you take a look at this? You'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll see the proof. <laughs> if you want to be a swing state, you got to be offering something to voters. And I don't think he's doing that uh, by just saying he's going to win. So it'll be close. Folksiness meter, 10 out of 10, right? We're, we're nailing Midwest. All that was missing was that he brought a hot dish uh, to the so you're you're at you're at from the upper Midwest. Score the uh, score the governor's uh, folksiness. I'll, I'll give it a nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. Okay, yeah, I, I needed Carhartt. But, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so it, how when we think about the Midwest, when we think about these key states, uh, the I as a as a resident of the, as a as a son of the Appalachian border regions of the Rust Belt. I don't like the term Rust Belt in the industrial Midwest in the upper Midwest. How's the Walls pick really play? You know, um, I, I think we'll find that out soon. I think that he does have some real vulnerabilities, you know, saying things like uh, socialism is just neighborliness. I mean, socialism pours very poorly in every mm-hmm. state you look at. Um, I think that, you know, Shapiro uh, was much more moderate on several issues, even where Democrats want to run hard on abortion. Uh, he at least said he supported the state's late-term abortion limit 24 weeks. Walls signed into law, uh, no limits abortion. Yeah. So I do think that these things um, are going to cause them some problems uh, in the Midwest. So, Linda, when um, Walls was in Congress, he was a moderate, and he represented a moderate, moderate district. And that's how he managed to get the thumbs up from both Joe Manchin and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Not something that you see. And Larry Hogan. And Larry Hogan. Not something you see every day. But as governor of Minnesota, he has been super ba-duper progressive, right? He has he has done so much more than and when you see the admiration that that loud and proud progressives in Minnesota have for him uh, tells you that they think he delivered. Um, which one of those are we going to see on the campaign trail? You know, I think it really speaks to the fact that Governor Walls understands that he has to represent all kinds of different people who have different opinions. That is part of what I think has made him so successful as a chief executive and also what has given him the ability to continue to draw people in. I mean, look no further than the fact that then-President Trump included him on his council of governors. Mm-hmm. He's part of the, part of the, the folks that that President Trump then looked to for advice about how to govern and responses to some of his policies. Not ideas. communist immediately, if not sooner? I, well, clearly he had Potentially communist immediately, if not sooner. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have laughed at that, but it was, uh, it, it did, uh, it was funny. T.W., um, Republicans say that they wanted, Sh- they, they were afraid of Shapiro, they helped wreck the Shapiro nomination, and that they're thrilled with Walls. Is that, how, mu- how much of that is stuff people say, and how much of that is true? Well, look, uh, there was no primary for the presidency. Kamala right. Harris was given uh, the presidential nomination, so the primary played itself out in the VP selection. Okay. And the far left, the uncommitted movement, the anti-Israel movement, the anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Semitic sympathetic wing of the party got their man. I'm not putting any of that on Governor Shapiro, um, Governor Walls, but I'm saying that's who is their man. And from the Republican vantage point is there is now no backstop to the liberal agenda of, of Kamala Harris. The getting rid of the filibuster to pass the Green New Deal, the voting rights for violent felons like the Boston bomber, uh, the border problems and getting rid of ICE. So the far left got their man. We don't need to go into personality attacks and things like that. 
focus on the issues and Republicans can be successful. And what do you what do you do when he moderates? What do you do when he comes out? If, if he could be moderate and then progressive, can he be moderate again? I guess you're going to you're going well, well, I, I would make the point that if you look at his performance in all of Minnesota and yep. among rural voters, he yep. underperformed Biden and he underperformed Obama by a huge margin. So this idea that he's going to now appeal to this whole new demographic of voters, I think it's a little overdone. He does rock the car heart, though. OK, coming up, <laughs> an alleged plot to kill U.S. politicians foiled the Justice Department charging a Pakistani man with ties to Iran. We'll assess the threat with the former top FBI official. Plus, J.D. Vance hits the battleground states of Michigan and Wisconsin. But as the GOP courts key voters, does the party have a personality problem? The head of the Republican National Committee, the man himself, will join us live. And here's a live look at Capitol Hill. A new criminal investigation into a member of Congress is rattling nerves. We'll discuss when The Hill on News Nation returns. Welcome back to The Hill on News Nation. Today, two self radicalized suspects were arrested for allegedly plotting a terror attack at a Taylor Swift concert in Vienna, Austria. All of Swift's shows in Vienna have been canceled as a result. And an unsealed criminal court document reveals a Pakistani national was arrested in New York last month on charges of allegedly plotting to assassinate former President Donald Trump and other public officials. Joining us now to talk about these worldwide terror threats is Rob D'Amico. He's a retired FBI special agent and founder of Sierra One Consulting. Uh, good to be with you. Good to have you with us today. Rob, you played a pivotal role uh, in counterterrorism for this country. What does this Iranian-linked assassination plot tell you about the state of our national security concerns at this moment? Well, one, I, I think the big thing is everyone thinks uh, it's tough to do an attack on this on this country, on, the, on, our, on our soil again. And this shows that uh, no matter what, uh, these countries are plotting it, be it a terrorist group and, and this one more of a nation state. Um, I think it just brings into reality that uh, we're not safe. But, you know, with agencies like the FBI and some of the other government agencies out there, we're constantly looking at these threats. We're constantly seeing what's really real and what's what's make believe. And this one turned out to be real and a potential uh, assassination. OK, uh, Agent D'Amico, another Iranian plot to assassinate a U.S. official uh, was when uh, former national security advisor John Bolton uh, was targeted by Iran. We know an attack from Iran is imminent in retaliation for an alleged uh, Israeli assassination of a Hamas leader who was in Tehran. Could U.S. officials be targeted in this Iranian response? I, I think so. I think this is all going back to General Suleiman's assassination uh, is killing in, in Iraq uh, back in uh, um, a couple of years ago, and it was it was odd because I was actually in Afghanistan at the time, uh, and I know the gentleman that you know uh, actually proceeded with that attack um, through the network. It was authorized by Trump, and I think they're really trying to get back at the assassination of Suleiman because he was such a, a a big figure in their in their uh, in their guard unit, and and it was a blow to them worldwide that we could actually get in, find out exactly what car he was in, and end up putting a missile in the car. So I think they're trying to get back for that. And there's a number of people in the national security apparatus that they're trying to get back at. And, you know, Trump being the top one. So I, I do think uh, even though he wasn't named in this, I think there's some probably some other higher level uh, clearance uh, information that points to that's probably who they're after. And when you would do things like be in Afghanistan, tracing these things down, when there's a heightened alert here at home, there's a heightened alert on these bases uh, and the and U.S. installations on foreign territory. Uh, this this affects uh, how they're living and what they're doing too, right? Absolutely. So uh, after the terrorist, uh, after the attack on Suleiman. 
Um, the Taliban used to rocket the U.S. embassy all the time, but they were very off. Uh, their, their missiles weren't very accurate. Um, and after uh, the U.S. killed Suleiman, they actually brought some Iranian folks in and to help them with their rocket trajectory. And matter of fact, the, the missile that they shot at the U.S. embassy was 100 yards from, from where I was living at the time. It was the closest rocket attack we had in probably five or six years. And it was definitely because the Iranians brought in their, their professionals to get that rocket to, to a better you know, in, injection into the U.S. system. All right, Agent D'Amico, we thank you for your service, and we thank you for your time. We appreciate you. Okay, uh, national thank security you. shapes elections. Seldom, seldom, but when it does, it's unmistakable. How does a heightened security situation affect the race? Uh, no one, Linda, in politics wants to think about the what-ifs, right? And we don't engage in the what-ifs because, God willing, the United States will be protected. But um, when when we're reminded of how quickly, and I was, uh, as an old person, uh, given cause to think about the Osama bin Laden tape that came out in 2004, um, do you see this as a national, how much do you see this as a national security election? Well, I think the fact that the former president narrowly averted an assassination yeah. attempt really kind of coalesced people from both sides of the aisle, whether you're paying attention to politics or not, around the fact that we're all Americans first. And we have to figure out a way to secure our borders. We have to figure out a way to keep our elected leaders, no matter what you think, safe. So I do think that this is going to continue to be something that, that captures the nation's attention. T.W., say something nice about what she just said, because that's the nicest thing. Do we, I, I want to bring yes. together a bipartisan moment of <laughs> good feelings. Good that, we're going to bring people that. together. She's right. I think the attempted assassination did highlight uh, the threat. And as we see these stories come out, people are now connecting that overseas threats can actually be carried out here. We've been very lucky yeah. uh, in the days since 9-11 and, and beyond, well, really since the Boston Marathon bombing that we haven't seen an attack on our soil and the problems that we're having overseas uh, all around the world. Uh, we'll see what those bring in the coming months. But I think it's really important when talking about Iran and, and my, one of my former bosses, Mike Pompeo, is, mm -hmm. is under fatwa from the uh, Iranian Supreme Leader, uh, that we make it clear through actions of deterrence, that we establish deterrence with our adversaries abroad. And I think the Soleimani attack, which he said helped establish that. Iran has not responded yet um, in kind directly to the U.S. They had a, an attack on a base overseas. But so long as we make sure we draw red lines around Iran, we can keep them at bay here at home. It's a mean old world out there. There is still much more ahead on the Hill. Donald Trump claims there's big movement to bring Joe Biden back into the presidential race. What's the thinking here? Is he losing focus? We will talk with the chairman of the Republican National Committee about that. And what is up with Elon Musk? We could ask that every day. But unrest at home and abroad is bringing new attention to the tech billionaire. We'll discuss that. And look at here, Air Force Two touching down in Detroit Rock City, where Kamala Harris and Tim Walls will speak at a rally. If it happens during our hour, we will, of course, bring it to you live. So stay with us, because you're watching The Hill. Welcome back to The Hill on News Nation. Kamala Harris and her running mate Tim Walls taking the stage any moment now for a rally in Detroit, Michigan. We'll bring it to you live as soon as it begins. It comes after the two fired up voters earlier today in Wisconsin taking shots at Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Donald Trump is not for you or your family. And Trump's running mate shares those same dangerous and backward beliefs. And it's a very clear thing. Yes, they are creepy and, and weird as hell. You see it. You see it. Vance also holding dueling campaign stops in the same battleground states. He first came out hammering Harris over what he says are her soft on crime policies while he was at a Detroit police station. It is a policy choice to defund the police, which is what Kamala Harris wants to do. It is a policy choice to open up the American southern border. The contrast could not be more clear between a candidate. Every law enforcement agency is telling you Kamala Harris is bad news. She makes it harder to keep you safe. After a few rocky weeks, the Republican vice presidential candidate seems to have found firmer footing. But how about the top of the ticket? Joining us now is Republican National Committee Chairman Michael Watley. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being with us. If Good to be with you guys. 
If politics is all about message discipline, your party is having a good day. Here's what you said in a post on Twitter. The Kamala Harris, Tim Waltz ticket is the most radical far left ticket in the history of our country. Now that echoes uh, Republicans up and down the line. I read very similar stuff and saw very similar stuff from Ron DeSantis, bunch of Republicans. This is in fact the same kind of attack we saw against Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, even John Kerry. Are Republicans back in their comfort zone? Yeah, look, I think that when it comes to talking about uh, Kamala Harris and, and talking about Tim Waltz, uh, we have a record that we can shine a light on. We have conversations that they've had, uh, social media posts, videos, everything else is right out there for the American people to see. Uh, and they are the most radically uh, leftist and, and progressive uh, ticket that we have ever seen in the history of politics. So uh, not real surprising that everybody uh, who, who is critical of them and critical of their record uh, is going to be on the same page. And as we're talking, we can see here the vice president being greeted by the crowd uh, in Detroit as she came off Air Force Two there. That's, uh, that's, that's what you're looking at live. Uh, now, one place where message discipline does not dominate is with your presidential nominee. Uh, in a recent post on his social media account, uh, uh, former President Donald Trump speculating that President Biden may take back the Democratic nomination. What are the chances? President Trump wondered that crooked Joe Biden tries to take back the nomination, uh, beginning with challenging me to another debate. What the heck is that, Mr. Chairman? What are, what are we talking about here? Look, I, I'm going to let the president uh, talk for himself on that. What I'm going to say is that uh, our message discipline has been very strong. If you look at his performance in the debate several weeks ago uh, that actually knocked Joe Biden, not just off the debate stage, but off the uh, ticket, uh, he was extremely disciplined. When you look at uh, our convention up in Milwaukee, uh, we were absolutely on message throughout four straight nights. And the president met the moment and delivered a great speech. In every single one of his rallies, he has hit his marks. Uh, the conversation that we're having right now with every American voter is whether or not uh, Donald Trump or Kamala Harris is going to do a better job at restoring our southern border, restoring our economy, and restoring our place in the world. And every single person, every single poll that we have seen that talks about those issue sets, which are the issue sets that voters care about, Donald Trump is winning in the head-to-head -head on, on the issues that Americans care about. Okay, this week a couple of very prominent uh, Trump supporters were talking about the rhetoric. Uh, listen to this. Our problems are personality. Their problems are policy choices that are hurting the average American and set the world on fire. If we can get our personality problems fixed, we'll win this election. We cannot just fall into the trap of criticizing the other side. Okay, Senator Lindsey Graham and Vivek Ramaswamy are hardly never Trumpers. Uh, but seems like the one at a Georgia rally over the weekend where the former president went out of his way to attack the state's popular Republican governor and revisit old claims of election fraud have some in your party worried. Do you guys just sort of have to roll with this and you do your message part and let the former president do what he's going to do? Well, we're going to stay on message, and the president is going to directly talk to the American voters about his vision for America. He is the only candidate in this race that is dedicated to securing our southern border, restoring our economy, and, and restoring, frankly, our place in the world and making sure that America is safe both here and abroad. Michael Wadley, we thank you for your time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Great. Thanks, Chris. Panel. Um, Donald Trump and I, uh, there there is no untrumping Trump, right, John? Like there there isn't there isn't a way. We went through the whole thing where it was like after the assassination attempt, it's going to be a new Trump. It's the same Trump. Meet the meet the new Trump, same as the old Trump, right? Yeah, I mean that you highlighted the the Georgia rally was just classic Trump can't get over the fact that it's not in his interest at all to be talking to to be uh, trashing the popular governor of Georgia in in Georgia. Yeah. But he just can't help himself because that's what he really cares about. So, and Julia, the, the whole name of the game here, this is, this, tell me, tell me, uh, well, only tell me if I'm right. If I'm wrong, just, just lie to me. But uh, the name of the game in this election is when the attention's on the other guy, it's good for you, right? right. Uh, the, the, in, in, a, in a season of sharp negative partisanship, when it's the other, when the other, other team is the story, that's probably good for you. Um, 
Democrats probably want this to be an election about Donald Trump, not an election about uh, Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, right? Absolutely. And I think that sort of almost plays into her pick of Tim Walz, someone who is pretty low key under the radar. I mean, sure, we're all talking about him right now, but he doesn't, you know, take up the spotlight. He does his job, he does his thing, and then he, you know, gets out of the way, or that seems to be, you know, his MO at this point. Um, but it was interesting. I was chatting with our friend Mick Mulvaney earlier this oh. week. Yeah. Yes, and he made a good point. And, uh, you know, I heard, you know, Senator Graham talk about policy versus personality Mm -hmm. and that, you know, the Republicans have a problem with personality right now. Um, Mick was saying that could be a real issue, obviously, for Republicans, especially when you have someone as nice as Tim Walls, um, you know, playing. Do you know do you know how good Joey Manchester is, how good Jay Manch is? (laughs) She can tease a segment. Without even knowing, oh, without even knowing here. that she's teasing it, she can do it. She's just that good. She's the best. Because now we're going to talk about Elon Musk. He's been oh, in the headlines yeah. worldwide for several reasons. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro challenged him to a fight. What? On national TV, after Musk called Maduro a dictator and claimed the country's election was fraudulent. In Britain, Musk could be called to testify in Parliament over X's role in the United Kingdom's recent riots. And Musk, now a major GOP donor, is facing calls from U.S. secretaries of state to fix X's AI chatbot after it spread false election information. With us to (coughs) decode it all is Mick Mulvaney, News Nation contributor, our friend, former Trump White House chief of staff. Mick, what's going on with Elon Musk? Can you please explain? Sure, I can't. I'd much rather talk about how Lindsey Graham is is getting his talking points from me and Julia Manchester. I think that's a much more interesting story. Um, yeah, Musk has Musk has got a problem, and and a lot of the American companies are going to have difficulty overseas. Keep in mind, Musk is facing difficulty right now, as is Facebook, um, in England because of their ties, their alleged ties between misinformation on their uh, websites and the riots that are that are plaguing that country right now. Um, the European uh, laws do provide a, a certain sort of protection, similar to our Section 230. And I know I just put half the audience to sleep, but no, essentially no, you're, the rule you're in getting this country, right in the hot zone. And Europe is that well, if I if the if I say something awful and false about Chris Steyerwald and the New York Times prints it, and it's slanderous, it's def- excuse me, it's defamatory. Chris can Chris, you can sue both me and the newspaper. If I simply put that same material on X or on Facebook. You can sue me, but you can't sue X or Facebook. That's what Section 230 does. And a lot of countries now are looking at getting rid of that protection. And it's come right to the forefront in in the U.K. over the course of the last 48 hours because of the connection between misinformation online and these very serious riots the country is experiencing. But help me from a business standpoint here. Uh, A lot of what Elon Musk does is dependent on government largesse, right? Uh, SpaceX uh, lives on government contracts and uh, Tesla relies on direct and indirect government subsidy for electric vehicles. Why is he causing so much trouble for so many governments when his company relies so much on the government? Oh, I, I just go back to the interview he gave about uh, the com- companies that had threatened not to advertise on X. Uh, and I remember him being on stage going, Are you really, you're really you threatening me with monetary penalties. I'm the richest man in the world. I, I, you can't hurt me on money. And I think that's the attitude he has right now, which is, look, I'm sitting on... Was a couple hundred billion dollars. I'm going to have my say, uh, and he's going to have his say. There's no question about it. I don't think they have the ability to shut him down. The real debate is going to be, uh, I think, Chris, on these social media sites, whether or not they are utilities uh, and mm. whether or not the government will regulate them like utilities um, or will they give them a treatment more similar to broadcasters and print media. So it's going to be a very, it's a very that- interesting time with a new technology. That is a talk that you and I are going to have because that's a very interesting issue. As always, Mick Mulvaney, we thank you so much. Coming up, Tim Walls and Kamala Harris set to speak any moment now in Detroit, Michigan. We'll bring it to you live. And we've got some A-plus super primo polling. We'll give you the good stuff, and I'll break it all down when the Hill on News Nation returns. News Nation, America's fastest growing cable news network, is now in more homes than CNN and MSNBC. Looking for a news network that respects all Americans? You have a new home. News Nation is news for all America. In Detroit, Michigan, UAW President Sean Fain speaking right now. We are waiting for Kamala Harris and Tim Walls to take the stage. 
But as they hit the campaign trail, campaign trail together, new polling shows the vice president overtaking former President Donald Trump. So let's break it down. Here we go. Take a look at some numbers. Would you like to see some numbers? They're probably out there. Here is, oh yeah, this is really good. I actually want you to see these. This is very, very good. These are the numbers in the Marist College. So the Marist Polling Institute is really good polling. I really like this poll. And they do their poll for NPR and PBS. There's the race, hypothetical matchup in July. She's down one point. Here's August. She's up by, she's up 51-48. Okay, now keep going. Next slide, if you please. Here's who can better handle the economy. That's how it was for Joe Biden. Here's Kamala Harris. You see the movement there. Trump down. She's up. And it's basically a statistical tie. What about immigration? Biden, one of Biden's worst issues. He was down 10 points. She's still down quite a lot, but she's shrunk that space on a tough issue. How about Biden's best issue, where he led Trump by a dozen points on abortion? Harris widens the gap even more than that. And on the question that Democrats have placed so much uh, emphasis on in this election, who could, who's better at preserving the election uh, or preserving democracy? And Harris does about the same as Biden, about a point better. And I would just say on polls about that, always, people who vote for Donald Trump think that Donald Trump is good for democracy. People who vote for uh, Kamala Harris think that Kamala Harris is good for democracy. That's how it goes. And there's a lot of reverse engineering. Can I... Will you let me complain about polls for a second? Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, no, it's not a complaint about polls. It's a complaint about how we think about polls. People who decide they're going to vote for Kamala Harris say, I like her. Therefore, I like her better on this and this and this and this. A lot of this is post facto, not pre facto. Right. right? Yeah. Absolutely. Look at Depends how on who you're here. asking. Well, OK, well, I'm asking you. That's, <laughs> and, and, and you're agreeing with me. And that's what's important here. Um, the how much of this, Linda, is Democrats who were trying to get Joe Biden out of the race, that Democrats were saying, I'm not going to say that I'm voting for I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm out. I'm crossing my arms and I'm waiting. And now that he's out, they can come back. None of them. None of None them. None of them. None of them. None of these them. polls are asking ordinary voters. What mm. do they think? They're not asking the party stalwarts what they think. OK, who may have different opinions. They may not. So I think what we're seeing is a real shift. Okay. And what you should be watching as a poll digester is really the overall trend lines. And okay. the overall trend lines are moving in a direction that is not good for the Republican ticket. You add to that the fact that we've seen incredible rallies. As a former organizer of Barack Obama's rallies, I haven't seen anything like this since yeah, the yeah, days yeah. I was really pulling all that together. It's hard to do. The and enthusiasm's the, real, the ground game is up, and you have a, a ticket that is really authentic. This is a woman who on our Sunday show early on put Virginia, or put North <laughs> Carolina, North Carolina. Uh, in her uh, blue column, and uh, she is feeling better about that now. T.W., so uh, is this a momentary sugar high that Democrats are experiencing, that things just are getting better and better, and that goes away when the race resets, or... This is the else. longest honeymoon period I think I've ever seen. Yeah. So yes, and a lot of this is Democrats coming home. Look, there was another poll that came out from an A-plus pollster that said Donald Trump is ahead in five of the seven battlegrounds. But I want to make a point. This election is going to be decided on a sl- thin sliver of people who dislike Donald Trump personally but believe that the policies of the Biden-Harris administration uh, are even worse. Now, um, because of Joe Biden's previous perceived incompetency that hurt him among that group Mm -hmm. with a new face that has helped uh, thin that gap out. But at the end of the day, people are going to say, does my distaste, these middle people, does my distaste for Donald Trump override uh, the policies of the Biden, of the Harris administration? That will be the determination. Can we explain how we go from a Kamala Harris that's uh, 45 to a Kamala Harris that's 51 in this poll? You know, it's 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 interesting because I think when she was at the you know second to Biden, her approvals were much lower. But the moment she you know took uh, charge of the ticket, it just completely flipped on a dime. I think a lot of it has to do with obviously Democratic enthusiasm. Biden was not ginning up that enthusiasm, but and I think her team has done a really good job of marketing her and marketing her to um, you know Gen Z voters, to younger voters, voters of color. They've done a good job of sort of putting uh, putting her she's good at a good job too of like putting the bright lit Ms. McCormick yeah 
She's taken no tough questions. It's been two plus weeks, yeah. and she has been able to have a set, stage managed rollout. I, well, credit to them, but yeah. at some point, the media writ large need to demand answers. What, what's what's she going to do on foreign yeah, policy? Yeah, JD Vance's what's troll today was was a good troll because he was rubbing the press's nose right in it. Right, he walked over and was like, "Oh, she won't give you any. Um, here I am talking to you. She won't even talk to you." And at some point, she's got to do it, uh, and she should do it right here. She should do it right I agree. here. Why not? Is that a formal invitation? Uh, as many, we'll send an engraved one, whatever you want. We'll, <laughs> we will be here. We provide snacks. Panel, we thank you all for being with us today. What a lovely, smart bunch here. of people. Uh, coming up, a live look from Detroit. Kamala Harris and Tim Walls set to take the stage any moment now. We'll discuss that with Leland Vittert. He is the host of On Balance after the break. Awaiting Vice President Kamala Harris, who is set to speak at an event in Detroit, Michigan, shortly. But while we wait, why don't we hear from the host of On Balance, my friend, your friend, Leland Vittert, who joins us now. Leland, you are an honorary Michiganian, Michigander, depending on how you, you put it. Uh, I'm what they call permafudge. The fudgies, people who buy the fudge are the tourists. Okay. I'm permafudge because I was there all summer. That, that I'm going to get you a T-shirt. Okay. It says, exa- says exactly that. Uh, how how do you handicap Kamala Harris's chances to win Michigan? If she continues on the trajectory she's on, uh, what do, what derails the big mo? Yeah, and uh, Tim Walls. So Michigan is not just Detroit, right? You have on the western side, you have other you in uh, in Battle Creek, and on that side of the state, you have other more conservative areas. Can sure. Tim Walls penetrate? That I, that, I think, is the question, more for you than for me, but I appreciate the, the turnaround here. Um, it's always dangerous when you give somebody this power. Uh, I would argue that it is yet to be seen if Tim Walls is a net positive or a net negative. We know he is a net positive with progressives who love him, yet to be seen if Tim Walls' identity and how he looks um, is what draws white rule men or his views and his past policies dissuades white rule men. If you want to know more about that, you should probably watch On Balance with mm. Leland Vitter right after this. Thank you for watching The Hill on News Nation. Set your DVR to watch us at 6 p.m. Eastern each and every weeknight. We'll be back tomorrow. On Balance starts right now. <laughs>